So in this unit, um, we're going to be looking at this markets and business types. <clears throat> the difference here, of course, is when we talk about markets, we're looking at the fact that not all markets are perfectly competitive. There are different types. And then also within those markets, there's different types of business models that we'll examine. So we'll start our discussion with market structures. I think that's the best way to do it because we'll look at the different types of markets and then within those markets, the different types of businesses. So there are several different types of markets within an economic system. Our study of supply and demand was based on a perfectly competitive market, but that's not the only type of market. You know, that's just one type that exists within the economy. Now, so what you have to think about is there's different types of economic systems. Within those economic systems, there's different types of markets. Within those markets, there's different types of business models. So first, let's look at these market types. So we have perfectly competitive, which we've looked at already, but we're going to go into more detail about. You have a monopoly, monopolistic competition, and then what we have is called an ogolopoly. So we have these four different market types that we're going to examine. So the first of these markets we're going to examine is one we've already been looking at, which is a perfectly competitive market. So from a characteristic standpoint, many firms sell an identical product to consumers, and established firms have no advantage over new firms entering the market. And the reason why established firms don't have an advantage is because of the fact that the product's identical. It's not like the company that's been there 100 years has a product that's different from the company that's been there since yesterday. They sell the same thing, so there's no advantage. There's no barriers to entry or exit. Anyone can enter the market. Anyone can exit the market anytime they feel like. And both buyers and sellers are well informed about prices. And the reason why is pretty simple. Because whatever that price is, that's the price that they're accepting. They don't have any way to influence price. So there are a lot of people buying and selling essentially the same thing. And businesses can easily start or stop selling in the market. So let's look at the uh, market outcomes for a perfectly competitive market. So there's a large number of producers, plus a product that can't be distinguished from another, leads consumers to not care where they purchase from. Doesn't matter where it comes from, it's irrelevant because it's all the same. So the producers are what we call price takers. Price takers are firms that cannot influence the price of the good or service they produce. It is impossible for anybody within a perfectly competitive market to actually influence the price. No one individual or firm can influence the equilibrium price. Whatever it is, is what it is, and they have to take it. The only people who, of course, could influence this would be the government, and then we looked at that with price controls. So agricultural markets are often perfectly competitive markets. Because of the ease of entering and exiting the market, corn is a good example of a perfectly competitive market. So. Whatever the price of a bushel of corn, farmers can sell as much as they can produce at that price. So if you can produce massive amounts of corn, you can, get, you can sell it all at that price. However, they're unable to sell a single bushel of corn at any price above that. If that price is $6 a bushel, they can't sell that corn at $6.01. And the reason why, of course, is because everyone else is selling at 6 so therefore, they accept the price in the market. They have no option. That's just, it is what it is. So let's continue to use corn for an example, and we can get a better idea of this. So perfectly competitive market for corn. So the demand for corn is perfectly elastic. The reason is that every farmer is a perfect substitute for every other farmer. You can't indistinguish farmer A from farmer Z. So when you look at it from a graphing standpoint, it's just a horizontal line. It's perfectly elastic. So we have 450 here. So this is our demand. Four dollars and fifty cents. That is our demand for corn. It's that's it. So farmers can sell any amount of corn at 450, but cannot sell any corn at a price higher than that. And that's the point of this perfectly elastic line you'll see here for demand. At 450, the quantity you can sell is unlimited essentially, but at any price over that, you can't sell anything. So this is why farmers just entering the markets are as competitive as established farmers, is because since that price is set and it's not changing, anybody can enter the market and sell corn and immediately start selling at that $4.50 a bushel price. Now they can never sell over it and make any money, of course. 
and they're not going to sell under it because that doesn't make sense because they're not going to make as much money. So everyone is selling at that price. So anybody can enter the market and sell. Okay. So first market we looked at was a perfectly competitive market. You can imagine it on one end of the spectrum. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum would be the monopoly. <clears throat> so a monopoly is a market with a single supplier of a good or service. It has no close substitutes and barriers to entry exist preventing competition. So monopolies are single producer markets that have no substitutes and prevent others from entering the market. Now in monopolistic markets, firms are price makers. So consumers are price takers in this sense. So why are monopolies price makers? Well, it's pretty simple to understand. There's a lack of substitutes and there's a lack of competition. When you remove those two things from the market, then the monopoly producer can set the price at anything they want. Since nobody can find an alternative to that product, they still have to buy it. And since there's a lack of competition, nobody is, uh, is rising up to actually develop a substitute. So for the monopoly market, the single producing firm is able to set a price and people are going to pay that price and they're going to make quite a bit of profit off of this. So the single biggest part of looking at a monopoly market is the uh, barriers to market entry. So monopolies develop in the economy as a result of barriers to entry. Uh, and there are natural barriers, there are legal restrictions, and then there's ownership monopolies. So these three things tend to lead to the development of monopoly markets. So the first thing we wanna look at are natural monopolies that occur uh, basically as nothing really being forced into place, it's just something that happens. So let's look at these natural barriers. So natural monopolies develop because one firm can meet the entire market demand at a lower average cost than two or more firms could, and their economies, over, or economies of scale over a relevant range of outputs. So let's kind of break that down to make that a little easier to understand. So average total cost is the total cost per unit of output. So for a natural monopoly, one firm can meet the entire market demand at an average total cost than you know, other firms combined. In other words, they can produce the good cheaper than other firms can combined. Now, economies of scale occur when long run average total cost declines as output increases. So from a natural monopoly's perspective, they're able to produce a good at a low cost and that cost gets lower as output increases. And they just simply can produce this good in a better, in a better way then multiple firms combined. So this means that the firm increased its factory size and employment by the same percentage, leading to increased output and decreased average total cost. Usually this occurs as a result of increased specialization among workers and more efficient use of capital. So this firm is essentially just placing itself head and tail, head, you know, head above other firms in terms of what it can do, and it's doing so on multiple firms. So a single firm is more efficient in production than the others combined. And that's the key point to the natural monopoly is that one firm is more efficient in producing this good than the other firms are together. So the second barrier to entry within a monopoly market is the ownership barrier. Monopolies can be created through the ownership of resources. If a firm controls access to a specific resource, then they control the market for goods produced with that resource. Um, for example, only country that has access to pandas is China. So as a result, if a zoo in another country wants to house pandas, they must acquire them for China. Uh, China therefore charges a very large amount of money, somewhere around the name of uh, $250,000 to gain access to pandas. So you can kind of think of it in the sense of if you were to discover some new resource, and you manage to control that resource, and that resource was being used to produce a good that was needed within the economy, you would have a, a monopoly within that market simply because of the fact that you were the one that owned the resources. Okay, so in addition to natural barriers and ownership barriers, we have legal barriers. So the government may create a monopoly by restricting entry into the market. So we were we operate within a capitalistic market. Basically, remember this is a mixed economy. 
And so because of that, there are certain aspects within the market in which we do not see, you know, free markets or capitalism. And legal barriers to monopolies is one of these cases. So when this occurs, they eliminate competition. And so you'll see here in this case, the government may create a public franchise, which grants a single firm the right to supply a good or service. So the best one example of this is legal monopoly. So when you think about the professional sports league, it's not like you could just create a team and go play the Tennessee Titans. You may win, but you can't just go and create that because of the fact that there exists a monopoly granted by the government to the NFL. So each of the leagues is a legal monopoly in which teams can only be created with the permission of the league. They also can't move and you can't just create a team and go play them. Now you can create a whole other league, but that league in and of itself is protected by laws that allow them to have a monopoly. So firms would not be able to create a team and play against teams in professional sports leagues. Second barrier to entry is that of government licensing, which restricts entry into certain professions or industries. You think about doctors, lawyers, and teachers, they all have to have licenses to practice. And so the license itself limits certain people into the field and keeps other people out. Now, this is entirely based, of course, on um, an educational level. So basically, they're just ensuring that these people are qualified to do the job they have. A third is that of patents. When the uh, government grants you a patent, it gives you basically legal control for an, a certain amount of years over that product and that being produced. You all see this a lot within um, technology and acquiring patents, but also within medicine in which you've got um, a new medicine will come out and it'll have a patent on it. And so for the X number of years, usually around 10 years or so, they're the only people that can produce that medicine. And then what will happen is once that patent comes out, you'll see the generics that, be, that are being developed around it. So patents give a firm or individual exclusive rights to produce or good or service for a specific amount of time. Okay, let's talk about the uh, monopolies and their pricing. So one of the things about monopolies is you tend to get this idea that they can just kind of set the price at whatever they want and that's just what people are going to pay. And that's actually not true. So even though firms are price makers, they still face a trade-off between prices and quantities sold. You gotta think the law of demand here. So as a result, monopolies must find a way to lower prices in order to increase the quantity sold. So and if they're unable to find a way to reduce prices, they could face bankruptcy. So a monopoly can go bankrupt even though it controls the market and it's a price maker because if it sets that price too high, then people simply can't afford to pay it. Remember the law of demand? It's, it's about the willingness and the ability of people. If you set the price too high, they may be willing to pay for it because they have to, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're able to. So monopolies are rather common in the economy because most firms have some control over their prices due to differences in their products. You know, Apple and Android have differences within their products and there are enough differences that allow them to control their prices to a certain extent. So it's not like Apple could just say, well, we're going to sell our iPad at $800 and people are going to pay that. But now they can set their pricing within certain ranges because that product is different enough from Android. And monopolies with substantial market power are actually very rare. Uh, the, the primary reason for this is the fact that few real monopolies exist, mainly because the government regulations don't allow it. And the majority of goods have substitutes. When goods are initially produced, that's typically when we see them have some sort of, uh, not even a substantial, but they do have some market power. If you think about like when the iPhone was first released, for a while there, Apple would have had a monopoly on it because that was the only product that was there that people were wanting to buy, but it didn't last very long because Android and other companies immediately began developing substitutes. So let's look in a little more detail at these government regulations. Um, mid to late 19th century, government did not interfere with industrial growth. In your US history classes, you tend to hear the term laissez-faire, it means hands off. Essentially, because the government wanted to support industrial growth, they basically turned a blind eye and allowed companies to do whatever they could in efforts to develop these powerful industries, which meant monopolies. And these firms controlled large sections of the economy. You can think about um, J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, these, these, um, these titans of industry, which essentially created these enormously large companies that controlled everything. And they did so because not only did the government allow it, but they actually were encouraging it. Now, in 1890, government passed the Sherman Antitrust Act. 
essentially it began to break down where trust had been created. And a trust, the idea here is that you've got a, a board of directors and that each member of the board of directors is essentially the board, or a board sitting on a board on another company. So basically that one central board has controlling interest over a large diverse number of companies. And so this gave the government the ability to reduce the market power of large corporations through the court system. It allowed the uh, courts to go in and actually break, the, break up these monopolies. And then in 1914, you had the Clayton Antitrust Act passed. And it banned the use of anti-competitive practices and also strengthened the use of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So between those two items, the government began to dismantle the monopolies and create more competitive markets. Okay, so we've looked at perfectly competitive markets. Now we're gonna look at imperfectly competitive markets, which is uh, monopolistic comp competition and oligopolies. So imperfectly competitive markets are those that fall between a mo monopoly and a perfectly competitive market. So, and there are two imperfectly competitive markets. There are oligopolies and the monopolistic competition. So if you look at the market spectrum, on one end you've got a perfectly competitive market and on the other end you have the monopoly market. Monopolistic competition is kind of in the middle and then the olig oligopoly is leaning more towards the monopoly side. So you kind of look at that spectrum of markets, kind of like we did the spectrum with um, economic systems, you do the same thing with markets. And of course you would do the same thing with uh, businesses themselves. So the first of these imperfectly competitive markets we'll look at is an oligopoly. So an oligopoly is a type of market in which there are only a few sellers, each offering a similar or identical product. The first thing that should come to your head here is something like an airline industry in which it, you can imagine trying to all of a sudden say, you know what, I want to open up an airline industry. It's not going to be easy. So there are also natural legal barriers to entry into the market by new firms. So oligopolies have a few firms controlling the market, offering similar and identical products. And then there are natural or illegal barriers that prevent other people from entering into that market. So these few firms may produce an identical good or service and compete solely on price alone. Or they may produce a good or service that is identical to the other firms, which creates competition on price, product quality, and marketing. So this is where you think about the airline industry. You've got all these different airlines and they're competing based on the price, but also product quality and then the marketing that comes into play. And this is where marketing really comes into play. So when you start talking about Nike, Adidas, Apple, Google, all these different companies, you start looking at them and you notice that marketing becomes a huge part of their budgets and of course in how they sell their products. And so we start to see marketing within these imperfectly competitive markets. There's no sense, of course, in a perfectly competitive market to use money on marketing because everyone is selling the same thing. There's no reason to do it in a monopoly because you don't have competition. So it's in these imperfectly competitive markets into which we see marketing and product quality become items of value. So each firm holds a large share of the market and both interdependence and composition, competition exist within the market. So competition exists within the market because of the incentive to earn the greatest revenues. Anytime you have more than one firm, you're creating competition. So every firm is trying to earn the most, the highest possible revenues they can. And so here's one of the issues that we see. If one firm lowers the price, it forces the other firms in the market to lower theirs as well. Remember now, by lowering the price, they increase the quantity demanded, so they're gonna sell more. Therefore, other firms in the market will do the exact same thing. So as a result, all firms lose possible profits. Because once one lowers, then the others lower, then you see this repetitive process. So what do all firms within the Ogallopoly do? They all try to set prices around the same area. So as you see here, instead firms work together to raise or lower prices as a group. That's why when you look at airlines, you'll notice that when one of them prices drop, they all do, or they all go up at the same time. Of course, at Christmas time, all firms raise their prices. Why? because they know you're flying and they know you're gonna pay the extra cost. So interdependence exists because the ability to increase profits can occur through cooperation between firms by acting like a monopolist. So ogolopolies, even though they're separate firms, will work together like a monopoly in order to increase profits. 
Um, the possibility of collusion is a constant threat in markets with an oligopoly. If the firms act together to raise prices, that's called collusion. It's illegal and it's a constant threat in markets with, within oligopolies. It explains why airlines at times will increase or decrease prices as a group. That is the single best example of the oligopoly you're going to find. So, entry into the market is hindered by natural barriers of wealth. Just think about how much money it costs to basically start an airline industry, a company. Also, legal barriers because the government must grant approval to enter the market and actually fly the plane. So, there are significant barriers to a company becoming uh, a part of the airline industry and as a result of that you see very few companies and those few companies of course control the market and at times work together to increase profits. So let's look at this uh, concept of collusion in a little more detail. So when we talk about collusion it's when firms act as one to set the market price. Collusion is a persistent threat in markets with an oligopoly. The large number of firms in monopolistic competition reduces the chances of collusion. So collusion doesn't exist in the other three markets. Collusion is something that exists within the oligopoly because of the fact that there's a small number of firms who can act as one, but it's illegal. Too many firms in monopolistic competition, no way possible for it to happen in a perfectly competitive market, and no reason, of course, in a monopoly because you're the only firm. Uh, oftentimes you hear the term price gouging. It's used to describe when all firms raise prices above equilibrium. So if everyone raised their firms above equilibrium, what happens, of course, is, is we're having to pay these higher prices. And so this is that term you see. A, a simple example is this. The only gas station is for 20 miles and you need gas. You're paying whatever that price is set at. It explains why um, when you look at gas stations, a lot of times the prices at gas stations near the interstate are actually higher than they are in the city. So if you're driving around Murfreesboro, look at the price of um, gas stations along Memorial as compared to those near the interstates. So even if that price is above equilibrium, you're still having to pay it. Now, another term you hear is cartels. Uh, OPEC, for example, is a cartel. So going a step beyond collusion is the establishment of a cartel. Cartel is an organization of firms acting together, hence OPEC acting to increase or decrease oil supplies. So they limit output, they raise prices, and thereby increasing economic profit across the board. So the use of collusion or the establishment of a cartel is illegal in the United States and most other countries. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen though, of course, because cartels can be formed across international boundaries. OPEC exists because it's formed across multiple countries. It's not something that exists within a country because it would be illegal, but because it's established along international boundaries, it can exist. Okay, so our fourth market type, monopolistic competition. It's probably the most common and the one you're most used to seeing because you see it all the time. Um, pick a product, it's probably in a monopolistic comp competitive market. So it's the other type of imperfectly competitive market. In a monopolistic market, there are many firms in the market selling a product that is similar but not identical, i.e. Uh, smartphones, tablets, computers, shoes, shirts, jeans. Pretty much all of these products that you buy are working within monopolistic com competitively markets because the products are identical, but there's slight differences in between them. So these firms are competing for the same group of consumers with each firm supplying a small portion of the market no one firm holding dominance. Think about shoes, for example. We have all these different shoe companies. At the end of the day, the shoes really aren't that different. What makes them different, of course, is one of the big things, the name on the shoe, and then designs and things of this nature. But in terms of a shoe being a shoe, they're just shoes. So each firm produces a product that is slightly different from that of other firms. But since no one firm dominates the market, the firms have little ability to influence the average market price of the good or the service they sell. Now there's no barriers to entry or exit in the market. So as a result, firms will enter and exit the market until economic profits are driven down to zero, like that of the perfectly competitive market. So this is what happens, is you end up seeing companies that actually aren't making economic profits because there's simply so much movement in and out of the market that's driving the prices down. 
Collusion is impossible due to the high number of firms and no barriers to entry or exit. It's impossible to collude because people can enter whenever they want and there's just so many firms within the market. Okay, let's finish our um, study on the uh, markets by looking into a little more detail on monopolistic competition. So remember, many firms selling a product that is slightly different from that of other firms. Products have close substitutes, but no perfect substitute. So this results in competition among firms in terms of price, quality, and marketing. Now, the reason why, and this is what you'll realize, the majority of markets in the United States are monopolistic competitive markets. Okay, so understand that the majority of markets are monopolistic competitive markets because we see competition among different firms in price, quality, and marketing. You know this is a result of buying clothes, different types of technology, and things of this nature. When you look at computers, for example, and all of the different computers that run a Windows operating system, they're not really that different. There's slight changes among them, but the quality and the marketing of those products and the price at which they're sold at creates the competition. So we'll use soap an example. So soap is soap. They all do the same thing and they're each a little different. We know soap's responsibility. It's going to make us clean and smell good. Every soap does the exact same thing, but each are a little different. Some smell different. Some will have little things in there that scrub your skin. Others don't. Others make lots of foam. Some don't. So there's all these little differences. You know, smell, ooh, some are round, some are square. Sometimes they're a bar, sometimes they're jail. So as a result, firms in monopolistically competitive markets rely on marketing to gain market share. So, extremely important, and we'll talk about marketing, is that most markets are monopolistic comp comp competitive markets, and marketing becomes the single biggest factor in who has control over the largest marketing share. So that's something we will spend time looking at.